right. So let's do this. So, oh, the, the mic doesn't. That does work. Excellent. So this is going to be fun. So. I mean, you have no idea what's expecting. So the last few years, I've been doing this kind of presentation about the new adventures and the front end stuff. And I got this really interesting feedback, which was surprising to me, because people tend to, uh, to tell, tended to tell me that it's not dirty enough. So I thought uh, I should step up the game. So for this session, I expect a lot of pragmatism from you. You're going to see a lot of no-nos, uh, but you know this stuff kind of works, so we can maybe use it. So. Uh, this is me. This is how it used to look like back in the day. And many of the things that we are kind of, I'm going to showing here are also from the stuff that we're doing. So we've moved away from this beautiful, shiny, clean, white design to something that's a bit darker, I would say, uh, red and stuff. But there is a button. It's very important to mention it. There is a button in the right upper corner. You click on it and it gets white. Very important. I get tons of emails every day about that. So. So you can actually turn that off. But today, we're going to play a game. It's not going to be about the site, but some of the techniques we encountered or discovered while working on the site. And so it's going to be the game called Responsive Adventures. And that's a game that's it's not that difficult to play, I would say. It just requires a lot of creativity. So who is a creative front-end developer? OK. Who loves email? Okay, who loves dirty checkbox hacks and this kind of stuff? Who is like, not many people. That's a bit sad because you'll have to play the game, okay? But for that, looking into the level of dirtiness, I hope you appreciate the timing. Looking at the level of dirtiness, we need to figure out how dirty do we actually want to play the dirty game. So, we can take it easy. Who wants to take it easy today? Nobody in the easy camp. We can take a medium level. <laughs> oh, going all the way. <laughs> oh, okay, this is going to be on you. Just saying, this is going to be fall on you. So at that point, I have to skip the first part because it's just too boring. I'm sorry. So this in mind, I have to jump to level two because you're a hardcore audience. Okay, let's go hardcore. Sorry, let's just jump a little bit. Apparently, we're going straight to bonus level. Lucky you. That's great. This is fantastic. So, the bonus level. Now, there are some things that tend to be difficult in the world, or in the life of a front-end developer. One of them is, of course, how to deal with the visited state. The infamous visited pseudo class is hard and difficult to deal with. It's very limited. There are only a few things we can do when actually designing our links or designing our background images to make sure that when somebody has visited a link, we cannot display all the stuff, kind of change the styling as we want because of the privacy concerns. So for example, a very common thing that we might want to do, if you have an icon on the left of the link, for example, you might want to change the opacity of it if the link has been visited. Now, lucky you, it is not possible, because it's restricted. Is there any remedy in near sight? Is there anything we can do if we just work hard enough and are creative enough to take it to the next level? Anybody? How far are you willing to go? Yes? Okay, this is way beyond dirtiness. <laughs> I mean, I was talking about something that's a, yeah, that, that will work, but we can discuss it. Uh, yes, this is like way beyond what I was expecting, but we could probably pull that off, yes. Something that's maybe a little bit nicer. Anybody? Interesting, maybe. Next sibling selector and display none. Hmm. Maybe that actually might work. So let's take a look. So what we essentially want, right? What we really want is really simple. It's not that difficult. Why is it so hard in life on us? What did we do to deserve this? You just want to have a little box on the left or on the right. And so if a link is visited, you want to you know, have it checked. And if it's not visited, you want it to be unchecked. So the way we would do this, Normally, we would think about like you know playing with color and background color, maybe opacity and things like that. But of course, for visited, it's very restricted. So we can style only color, background color, border properties, and outline color. 
And the alpha channel of these styles will be ignored. So if you want to change opacity, it's not going to work. In the same way, if you have an RGBA value, for example, the alpha channel will be ignored. And also, if you want to like, look it up in the window, create compute style, it will always return the value of a non-visited color. That's kind of restrictive. So if we wanted to have something like this, one of the dirty techniques that's been used by DuckDuckGo for a while is to say, well, why don't we have two links? They all lead, both lead to the same thing, uh, but because we can't have you know, like a change of opacity and things, what we're going to do, we have one link, which is actually just a text link, and the other one, the first one, is then actually the, uh, the link with the background image. Oh, sorry, the second one is a link with the background image result check. And what we have is, well, we can draw a little check mark, of course, with before pseudo element, right? And position things a little bit so it appears to the left. And then what we think, what we do to make it all work, is that we hide that thing with the ability hidden, and we display it if necessary on visited. And specifically, we are going to change the color of that second link. So that icon will actually, or that content, um, um, the text that we're actually appearing with the check mark is going to be displayed, but then we need kind of two links to make it work. So there is another way, and the, the kind of a better, dirtier way is to actually just include an SVG inline. Because we can style only color values, that's right, but that also includes SVG's fill and stroke attributes. So what if we set a fill property on an HTML element that's been visited, on a link that's been visited? Now here's what we can do. No? We can't do it? It froze. My time is going on. Oh, come on. OK. No. So what we can do here is following. We can set fill on visited state. And then we have, of course, our little maybe you know, a set of SVG icons. And we might want to reuse them, obviously. And so here, it should probably work. And it actually does work. However, as we know now, the alpha channel doesn't work. So RGBI is not, RGBA is not going to work. Okay, without the thing, right? So at this point, the alpha channel is not going to be work because it's going to be ignored. So if we want to achieve this, the best way we can do it is to say, okay, we have the checklist, the unordered list, and we have a list item where we have a, you know, let's say front end conf uh, in there. And so we also have the SVG icon. Uh, it's kind of set as a symbol so we can actually reuse it. And so what we can do then, we put it on the left. And what we change is the fill property on the visited state of the link. At this point, it's going to be inherited by the SVG icon, and then actually we get what we want, right? That's really straightforward. It's not really bad. It's kind of easy to use. So this is what we can achieve really easily with SVG today. But actually, that's not quite what we want. We usually want something a bit more visual, maybe change again the opacity of an icon that we have on the left, as well as the text of the link or the color of the link that we have on the right. And this is where we can abuse CSS blend modes to achieve semi-transparency on icons, for example, using a shade of gray as the background by a background blend mode screen. What blend, uh, background blend mode screen does, it, it looks into the image and background color, which will be inverted first, then they'll be multiplied, and then inverted again. That means if we have an image like this, or two images like this, we have an overlap, so they're going to be inverted first, then multiplied, then inverted again. So specifically for a link, right, if we have, let's see, have a video, I have a video here somewhere. I think I had a video here somewhere. So specifically, if we just make sure that the background color is a little bit, no, not too light, so not too dark, so just right, kind of becomes grayer, so it feels grayed out, right? So if we change it from background color zero, zero, it doesn't play, or it does play. I think it did play. Like this? Oh, it's not playing for me. Sad. So <laughs> if we change it like to 333 and 666 and 999, how well do you know your hex colors, by the way? Can you spot the hex color of that t-shirt? Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I, I'm scared now. But one way or another, what we can do is we can change the background color, and by using mixed blend mode, or background blend mode, we can kind of mimic the grayness. So as a result, we end up with this. We have an unlisted, unordered list, we have the news item, and the only thing we need to change is essentially background color now, not fill, but background color on that visited link, and we're kind of done, right? So it's really not that hard to do. But of course, we have our good old friends. <laughs> our good old friends specifically locking into IE, actually, but also Promini not supporting it, but again, this is kind of an enhancement. I know what you're thinking. 
that's probably not what we want to do for a living. And that's good news because this working group is actually working on a reliable future-proof solution, so we're going to get away without this kind of hacks. The problem is you can circumvent all these visited restrictions at this point just by using background blend mode. Right? So if you're interested in this, that's a nice article to look into, and this is another one which goes kind of in a similar direction. So let's say no visit it, that's not a big deal. Let's go and look deeper. What can we do with images? And there's actually a lot of stuff we can do with images. So here's a question for you. Now we know that images make up a large portion of the payload. Now they are not blocking rendering, that's pretty good. But if you're working on the landing page, you probably want that product page to contain image and display images as fast as possible. Right? And so at this point, we really have to worry about delivering images fast, and more so, we want to deliver images in good quality. So how far are you willing to go to optimize that here image on that critical landing page? What can you do there to make things really shine with your images? So the user doesn't have to wait for ages to see the actual image displayed. Or more specifically, maybe, If you have a situation like this, which is probably quite common, right? Like this, where you have a background image or a foreground image, but you have a drop shadow and a quite prominent product image that you want to display fast. Now, one thing we can do here is, of course, say, you know, not a big deal. So we have options, right? We have BP, we have BP, WebP, we have JPEG, we have PNG, we can use GIF. Please don't use GIF for this. We could use all kinds of different, oh, Flash, whatever. We have options. Uh, but it's probably not a good idea. Why? Well, if you think about saving this as, a, as JPEG, that's going to be quite not that big JPEG. But the problem is the drop shadow. The gradient is not going to compress well. With WebP, it would be fine, but we still need a fallback for browsers not supporting WebP. And of course, you could say we can source, save it as PNG. Right? But the problem is you're going to end up with a really big, huge PNG file that might be easily, for like a full-width image like this, could be easily beyond one megabyte in size. So that's pretty, not, you know, pretty much not that great. Right? So what we can do there, I have to jump here a little bit again. Uh, what we can do here, of course, is to separate responsibilities. So we can say, OK, we have a JPEG image, and we have the alpha channel for PNG. And we're using both of them together inside of an SVG container uh, by using one of them as a mask on top of the other. Right? And then as we plug in the image, what we're going to do then is just say, OK, we're going to have image source SVG file in both cases, both for both background images and for ground images. And because we developers are lazy, there are, of course, tools. It allows us to upload an image and then separate responsibilities in the JPEG and PNG part. I think that many of you know this technique. This is kind of the basic stuff of what we can do there. We can also use a wonderful contrast swap technique, right? Where we can say, let's have a big image. Sure, no problem. But we can remove all the image contrast and then reapply contrast using CSS filters, right? Because this, this end result will look exactly the same. And in fact, you are saving a lot of data. But if somebody, for some mysterious reason, chooses to save that image, well, <laughs> bad luck, right? I would say. But you can end up actually saving a ton of, um, ton of space there, um, which is pretty good. And in terms of also computation, like actually rendering or painting of the thing, apparently, according to Yuno Kravitz, who actually came up with this in her study, um, it's quite negligible. So you will end up with. Um, I don't know what it was, I think 27, 0.27 milliseconds difference. So that's, that's quite negligible. And again, filters are all supported, except you know who. We're used to it at this point. But uh, you can actually really go ahead and try to look into it. I mean, for that critical image, it might be fine. I mean, not for every image, of course, but for some, it might be fine. And then there is this technique that's been around for quite some time, and it's probably a bad idea to use it today. Um, the point there is if you have two identical image, images that are displayed at the same size on a website, one can be much smaller or much, uh, one can be much smaller than the other in file size if it's highly compressed and much larger in its dimensions. So if we look at this image, which is 600 times 400, and it's saved from Photoshop in a pretty bad quality, 0% here, and we display it as 600 times 400. So the file size at this point is 7K. And I think that you can see that it's pretty bad. But if you break it down and make it smaller into 300 times 200 and compare it against an image which is 
you know, six, uh, which is 300 times 200 natively exported from Photoshop in a pretty decent quality, let's say 80%. Well, most people will not be able to tell the difference, but the image on the left is 21K and on the right is 7K. So that means that for every image that you have, you could blot it up two times two, right? So you have four times more pixels and you save it with the worst possible quality. <laughs> Please don't do that. It's really misusing browser's resources, for one, like in terms of memory, and it's kind of not really you know, future-proof. But I see like many, there are many resources using that because you can do something else instead. One of the things that really works well is by blurring things that are not necessary. Now, one of them, if you look into this image compared to this image, most people, again, will not be able to tell the difference, but the only thing that's different is the blurriness of the background, which is, again, not that important at this point. But the difference in the result in terms of file size is approximately 70 kilobyte, which is kind of noticeable, right? Um, so you can do that. We can blur out un unnecessary details. I mean, we can also go into black and white mode, of course, but, you know, and start removing colors. Maybe a bit too much, right? But we can do better, right? Of course, I'm glad that you agree with me. Um, because we have obviously two kinds of JPEGs on the web. We have sequential or baseline JPEGs, where the image is coming from the top to bottom. And then we have progressive JPEGs, where the image is blurry at first, and then it gets better over time, because there are multiple scan levels involved. And in fact, the scan levels have defaults. And if you feel like, you know, on a weekend, if you feel like playing multiplying matrices and walking around things in image encoders, you might end up with just the right coefficients for your particular image. So you might say, let's look in brightness and luminosity and all those things and figure out just the right coefficients so my image is actually at the best size. Because what your goal ultimately is to ship fast and show soon. So some particular coefficients might work better so that even already on the first level, on the first scan level, kind of show pretty decent quality, at least the structure of the image. And the only thing that's different on the second and the third and the fourth is the color depth, which is, of course, then corrected. But the structure is already visible at, at layer one. And of course, you don't want to do that, you know, uh, for every image, it would be just ridiculous. But there are two cool tools that actually allow you to do it almost automated. Uh, and take care of it. One of them is ADAPT, the Adaptive JPEG Compressor. And the, the other one, which I use all the time, is MOS JPEG, which is probably um, a, a really good one. But then, of course, Google also likes Broadly and uh, Zopfly and everything that ends with Lee, because you know, I guess many Swiss developers here really are into compression. So there is also Goodsly, which is a new open source JPEG encoder. But as far as I remember, uh, it actually only works with baseline JPEGs. But I'm, I'm sure that Jake will correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, so that is also an option worth considering. But of course, there are contenders, and one of them is Dropbox's Lepton. How many of you heard of Lepton image compression? I want more hands next time, because Lepton image compression is actually really, really good. So it allows you to save 22% losslessly from images, and it's very stable. So it doesn't matter what kind of JPEGs you're pushing through it, you will always get this kind of savings, which is actually a pretty good thing. Now the problem is, it's not backwards compatible or compatible with JPEG at all, so that's an issue, but, because we want to go dirty, we can go dirty, right? So Lepton isn't compatible with JPEG, but they can be easily and losslessly decompressed as a, to a standard JPEG. Now what we could do is, the Lepton converter could be compiled to ASM.js or VASM and run inside a service worker, so browsers downloads a small Lepton file, the service worker converts it to a JPEG, and the browser then displays it, right? I mean, file savings, file savings, so we're getting file savings, okay? But you're kind of relying on service work and JavaScript, so that's a little bit, little bit annoying, maybe, right? But it depends on what you want to do with that landing page. One way or another, please do not use GIFs, and we can replace them with video, because we can also have autoplay and the looping and everything for, you know, like, a sh like a one eighth at this point of the file size. And also, when we're talking about like the loading time and stuff like that, it's actually pretty convenient to do that. But I know what you're thinking. No, there is something else out there. This, right? How are we feeling about this? 
The learning is first, and then the content kicks in. The squip, as it's called, the squip technique. Anybody who loves it? Who hates it? Who doesn't really have an opinion and want to get lunch? <laughs> OK, that's fine. Well, the way it works is kind of tricky. It's a little bit you know, messy and stuff. So you use the diff to render the image. Then you request a small thumbnail. Then you draw the thumbnail onto canvas and apply that blur effect. Then you request a large image. And then you render a large image and hide canvas most of the time, uh, which ends up with this. right? So I was like, I want to drink now. Seriously, this is like, I don't want to do that. But you can also automate it, of course. However, we can maybe do it a bit better, or at least have a little better visual effect. From a performance perspective, there is one important thing that we want. Now, we don't want to display nothing at all, because that image, while that image is being loaded, to avoid those jumps, content jumps. So we need to reserve space for sure. And we also want to avoid layout calculations where things kind of move around. So there are alternatives. Uh, we can do this, for example. We can do just reserve the space. We can have a default image, right? Profile image at this point, avatar. We could also have a background image, or the, sorry, background color applied. So it's not nothing, at least it's something, right? Or we could also have the blurriness effect. So on Google Arts, for example, as you scroll down, you will see this quite a lot, this background image, or the, sorry, background color kicking in. But why background color if you can use gradients, right? Or different shapes. There is nothing wrong with different other shapes, right? You can just do whatever, like everything. Um, and at this point, you can maybe turn something as a, which is just a boring placeholder into something that's a bit more interesting. Maybe even art, like this, right? So you can actually have an approximation. When you actually trace an image, and that image is converted into an SVG, which is maybe using different just geometric shapes, and so you try to approximate that image before it actually gets loaded. And then when it gets loaded, you transform from one view to another. Right? That just requires a little bit of tracing. That's not a big deal. And there is a Kenny edge detector that allows you to do that. Essentially resulting in placeholders moving into images looking like this. Right? Or if you kind of look at it in the bigger scale of things, you can literally trace the structure of the image. Right? And as you go, you just display the structure already quite quickly, and then that JPEG kicks in. Right? That looks a little bit nicer. And in fact, what you can do there is reproduce images with geometric shapes to convert a bitmap image into SVG, consisting of those overlapping simple shapes to create the structure. Right? And then you have created a, uh, SVG and optimize it and add a uh, Gaussian blur filter to it. And the result is very small. That's the thing. So you're showing something, which is obviously only approximation of that image, but that will be usually even 600 bytes to 800 bytes, which is quite remarkable, right? So it's not just blurring and showing nothing or showing a very blurry thing. It's kind of showing the structure, which is pretty nice. And even better, because we have SVG then, we can also use stroke dash array, dash offset array thing, where we can have this kind of animations as well, right? And so this would look like this. And then when the image kicks in, right, it's already going to be there. And in fact, there is this Cloudinary SVG placeholder technique where you plug in an image, it does the tracing, Cloudinary generates a thumbnail, right, and then turns that SVG tracing thing into the actual image. It's a little bit more complicated, <laughs> but you kind of get the idea, right? So if you look into it, you can just type in Cloudinary SVG placeholder and use this technique today. I think it's a bit better than traditional good old placeholders, right? Um, and this is another technique that um, uh, Jose from Spotify has been experimenting a lot in this field. So he's a really like many of the demos that I showed are actually from him. But I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. But this is not quite what we want. Because how many of you had a situation at some point where you're getting a client, and the client sends you an image, which is maybe 300 pixels times 400 pixels, and you need to display it properly on the retina screen, maybe like in a double resolution or so. And the client is like, I don't have a better image, just deal with it, right? Anybody was in this situation before? I have answers for you, because there is magic, which is called machine learning. And essentially, the way it works is brilliant, brilliant. So you upload an image, and then, using our wonderful predictive technologies, we can guess pixels and actually extrapolate images and make them bigger than they actually are. And in fact, it works really, really well here. 
So you upload an image in a pretty bad, like average size, and then can scale it up to four megapixel. And of course it's fake, but you know. <laughs> so if you're interested in it, so let's enhance IO is a really, uh, really nice service that allows you to do that. They're just using machine learning. That's a really cool thing. You can literally blow up and scale up an image, which was not possible in the past, right? So that's, that's pretty nice. Oh, yes. We need to deal with web fonts, because web fonts are killing performance. They're horrible. But we love them. Oh, they're, OK. We, we do love them, one way or another. So we want beautiful type, but performance matters too. So what's the most performance strategy for loading web fonts today? Now, we can use type kits. We could use Google fonts. We can actually, of course, save, like, store fonts on our servers and serve it from there. And specifically, when we're looking into fonts and variable fonts that are coming, we might have tons of families that we need to deal with. So we better get ready for all those fonts. So how do we avoid loading too much? How do we avoid delays when the fonts are kicking in? What would be the ultimate strategy, the dirty one, to get there, to get to the point where we want to be? Anybody? Emails? Images. Images. <laughs> Like, save all text as images? Oh, <laughs> that just hurts. You can't do that. That just goes against everything we've ever spoken about at this very conference. No, we can't use images. Anything else? Yes? Well, we can use resource hints for one. Anything else? Placeholders. Mm. Placeholders. We could, I'm, I'm curious to explore what exactly you mean by that. Uh, yes, so, so like uh, if you use loading, you have this gray lines instead of text. Okay, so we could have like gray lines, but we could also just, you know, display the text in the fallback font. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> right? So what are we going to do? Now remember the good old times when things used to be simple, when you plug in the link and you put in the font and it's going to do the magic and you can forget about it and go home to your friends and to the people you love and to your dogs and cats and forget about it. These times, my friends, are over. <laughs> because we have, need to have a font loading strategy, right? We need to figure out what the easiest way to do to deal with fonts is not to use them, <laughs> right? Or, of course, we can use just generic fonts that are available on the platforms. That, that would work as well. But the thing is, it really does require some thinking. There are many, many things that we need to keep in mind there. So I need to jump a little bit here. So essentially, what we're ending up to, with today is a couple of techniques that actually tend to work a bit better than the others. Now, if we look into how web fonts are being loaded, you know, as of today, we probably don't need to worry about our good old friend EOT. Oh, God, for EOT. Sounds, <laughs> EOT, I have goosebumps. EOT, so we can deal with WOF2 and WOF and open type, obviously. And so what happens is when these fonts are declared, then a font family name is used, and if it's used in CSS, browsers will match it against all font face rules, download web fonts, and then display content, right? And so we end up with this, uh, where we might have a, like a longer, lengthier, font stack, we'll be highlighting not only you know, that web font that we want, but also kind of targeting specific platforms, iOS, Android, and all the others, right? But still, very often, we're kind of, well, you know, we're relying on Google Fonts or on Typekit to load stuff, and that causes delays, right? Because we're requesting HTML, then we discover that we need CSS, we get CSS, and then we discover that we need fonts, and as a result, the entire thing is delayed. And if fonts aren't cached yet, they will be requested, downloaded, and applied deferring rendering, which is why the first experience that many of our customers have are not content first and not mobile first, but link underlines first. <laughs> right? So you can at least step somewhere and see that something might change. Right? And we have two different behaviors which kind of evolved over time, void and fault. Essentially, I think that at this point, which is actually really good news, we have better control about how it's actually going to be loaded. Right? In the past, we always had to figure out what is going to happen and when, but now it seems like we have the tools. And so this is what's happening in the slow motion. There is a three seconds timeout by default in Chrome and in Firefox. 
uh, and I'm not sure about Safari. I think I think it changed as well. Um, and then after three seconds, you have a you just switch to fallback font if the fonts haven't downloaded yet. And then as fonts kick in, you kind of have that switch. I think just keep switching from one to the other, right? And so there are a couple of things we can do. We can use today. We can use font loading API. We can just create a font face object and kind of control how things are going to look, or what we're going to apply, depending if the fonts have successfully loaded or have successfully failed. Right? Um, so that's pretty nice, and it's actually really well supported. So we can do that on our side. I mean, we're used to this at this point. Uh, but then there is also another idea, which is really interesting, which goes beyond that, of course. Many of you might have heard of critical CSS. And so why don't we apply the same thinking to fonts? When we have critical fonts, or critical subset of fonts that we're loading first, potentially even inline, and then load the full font later, like we usually do with critical CSS. And so you can think about the two-stage render. When you have a subset, that subset usually will be Roman. I mean, sometimes you can go all the way if you really feel like it. You know, you could say, I will look at all the pages I have on the site, and I'm going to collect all the characters that I'm using, and I'm going to kill all the characters that I'm not using, so if on the Friday a copywriter comes to me and wants to change something from comma to an am dash, sorry, I'm going home, right? <laughs> because you don't have characters in that subset. Well, don't be that person. That's just a little bit too much. Maybe it's a bit too harsh. I mean, these copywriters are people, nice people. So what we can do instead is say, OK, let's figure out a reasonable limit, a reasonable kind of first stage, standard, uh, um, um, first stage render subset. And then the second one is going to be, of course, the full one. Right? So you subset it to what you need, to the minimum. And then uh, you will actually load in the full thing uh, asynchronously. And there are a couple of things you can do there. You can load it with you know, data URIs or with preload. And there are tons of those techniques again. They all have different advantages and disadvantages. But this article is constantly updated. But Zach Leatherman um, kind of keeps it all up to date. But you can really get to decent results by using this two-stage render. That's actually a really uh, useful technique to use. And so with this critical, you will end up starting render faster. But I thought, you know, I can do acronyms. It's not just the others. So this is a new beast in town. Welcome. The critical two-stage fourth trend with a service worker, because you can. <laughs> right? Also, conveniently abbreviated as C2SFOFTRSW. You're welcome to use it and tattoo it and whatever you feel like. And essentially, it's just the same thing, two-stage render. But then what we do is a lot of the subset it fought a Roman first inline, then we put the entire thing in service worker, and so every time you request the page, we're checking if it's in the service worker's cache, and if it is, we're retrieving it, and then we're going to display the content in that font, right? But of course, I mean, you can do a lot more with this. Um, because if you really want to figure out which, which of the uh, characters you need on your site, you can use Glyphhanger for it. Uh, but you can also automate the entire workflow of having this thing, the entire thing, the subset inlined and detected and inlined in your templates using subfont, which is really, really good. So it kind of automates the entire thing for you. So you don't have to do much at all. You just plug it in in your build process, and then it will discover it all automatically. Kind of crawl the pages and do whatever you need. Highly encourage you to kind of look into it. Right? And you end up with a pretty decent result, which is actually quite close to system fonts. I don't know what happens here. It's not my test. It's a test by the guy who created uh, subfont. But it's really close to local font, like um, OS fonts. So you're getting into really, really good results. And the feedback was remarkable, too. Right? And I know what you're thinking. Come on. I don't want to do all this work. We have HTTP cache. So why don't we just deal with HTTP cache? Well, how many of you remember this article? Oh, I feel quite old now. So this is a very nice article. It changed my life forever. Actually, it did. 2007, where they started looking into how likely is it that things that are added to the cache actually stay in the cache long term. And so in Yahoo's case, when they actually did it in 2007, the results were quite surprising. According to them, 40 to 60% of Yahoo's users have an empty cache experience, and 20% of all page views are done with an empty cache, although actually they should have the files. And you might say, okay, 2007, that's a long time ago. So Facebook repeated the same thing two or three years ago, and they ended up with quite similar results. And the thing is, and that's kind of really critical for fonts, not so much for CSS and JavaScript, uh, and as you can see here at the bottom, on average, 
44.6% at the bottom, 44.6% of users are getting an empty cache, which is very similar to what Yahoo discovered in 2007. And so if we look into it, we need to really explore why that happens. And if you look into the caching, and you know, there is a lot of stuff to say about caching, what's important for us in this context is the first files that are going to leave the cache are usually fonts. That means if some users tend to come to your website every now and again, but not like every day, it's very likely that they will have that switch from fallback font to web font way too often, maybe even on every second visit or so, or every third visit. And that's kind of frustrating or annoying. You know, the fonts that are supposed to be in the cache will not be quite in the cache, right? And that's kind of bad. So this is why we have to worry about really putting them in a place where it's really, really kind of resilient. And service worker cache tend to be a bit more reliable than HTTP cache. Another thing you could do is always split those fonts, right? So if you have, let's say, a multilingual project and you have a font, um, uh, one font for it, like Open Sans in here, you can actually say, okay, I'm looking into Latin, I'm looking into Cyrillic, and I'm going to split them into two. So I'm not going to load one that's going to cover everything, but I'm going to use the Unicode range to define if, that, if the characters on that page have one, uh, sorry, if, the, if that page contains at least one character in that Unicode range, I'm going to load that font. So for example, if you have a page and you have no Kyrillic characters there, although both font faces are, uh, um, well, font face are defined, only the Latin one is going to be downloaded if there are Latin characters. Right? So although both are defined, if there are no Kyrillic characters, the Kyrillic file will not be retrieved, which is actually really good. But the thing is, can you spot that Unicode range? What is that range? It's so magical, isn't it? It's like, ooh, what is it? Well, I was at a conference, and at that conference, we started playing a little game. Can you guess the Unicode code point of that very important you know, emoji, which is, of course, the beer? <laughs> oh, let's introduce it better, the beer. <laughs> okay. Can you guess what Unicode code point that is? Well, what do we do? Normally, when it comes to a question like that at the stupid party, you would say, OK, let me open up in Google. But come on. Cool people don't do that, right? And we can do something better. We go to a library, and we pick up the Unicode book. <laughs> right? And we look at this book for a while. <laughs> and then we buy this book. And then we put it on our kitchen table, because come on, this is a very cool book to have. And then when somebody comes to you and tells you, can you spot that you know, beer Unicode symbol, you can say, sure, let me come back to you in a moment. So you go back home, and you open the book. <laughs> and it's a fantastic book. You start looking, and it's A, <coughs> B, C, and A, all the symbols kind of grouped together. That's wonderful. And if you work hard enough, Eventually, you land in the food section, and then the drink section, and then you keep going and going, and then <laughs> you find that character, which is, of course, as you all must have known, obviously, U1F37B. Now we know, okay? So that's going to be very important, obviously. But then, of course, you could go ahead and say, you know what? I really like emoji. When it comes to fonts, it's, like it's, it's a good thing to have, right? So why don't we just make more use of them? <laughs> right? We tend to have all these BAM classes and stuff. Oh, maybe this should be a, like a better naming convention, a newer naming convention, the emoji naming convention, also with underscores, if you like. It's not very cacheable, and the gzip isn't really going to do the best out of it. <laughs> but, you know, and debugging. Debugging is a little bit hard. <laughs> But, you know, you could pull that off. That, that's fine. By the way, I'm just saying, at this point, we are at 194 out of 1,256 slides. <laughs> but we will have lunch, I promise, in one minute, I guess. But you can do more with this. I mean, Unicode is very cool. I mean, you could do art with CSS. Oh, oh doesn't work, doesn't play anymore. Uh, you can do art, right? Isn't it beautiful? I think it's very nice. So you can just randomize that hexadecimal. OK, I'm going to be too, it's a bit too deep. It's just, I would just print it out and sell it. No, buy it. It's just incredible. So this is a very nice way of getting to know all this uh, Unicode ranges. Why am I talking about this? I'm not sure. 
Uh, actually, that's not important. But what's important is there is a new kid in town. Remember I talked about the fault and the fault and things? Well, I think, uh, this is a slide from Monica Nicholescu. She's also speaking in this conference. Um, and we have font display optional, which allows us to control how, how web fonts are going to be displayed, or the content will be displayed. So by default, and it's really well supported too now, so we can say, well, the default is block, which means it's going to be invisible for three seconds. This is a timeout. And then if the fonts kick in within, uh, at some point, then we're going to have a switch. Right? And then you can also have swap, where you say, OK, I'm going to display the fallback right away. But then whenever the font kick in, I'm going to have a swap. Right? But then also you can have fallback, which means you're giving the browser 100 milliseconds to fetch that file, either from the cache or from a service worker cache and whatever. And then if that happens within that 100 milliseconds, well, then you're going to display the content right away in the actual web font. So you're not going to have a fallback font like Arial, Georgia, and others, but you're displaying right away the web font. Right? And if it doesn't happen, then you give another three seconds timeout you know, to get that font from somewhere, and then eventually you have that switch. Or there is optional, which kind of gives it, um, leaves it up to the browser to decide if it wants to load that font, uh, display that kind of had that switch or not. Right? So fallback and optional are really, really great options. And of course, <sighs> it's kind of the same story, but I mean, with IE, nothing is going to happen. Edge is working really hard on a lot of this stuff. So that's really, really good. That's really, really cool things. Cool, cool thing. Okay. Um, and if you're interested in this stuff, in the web phone thing, so Peter Muller, Munter, uh, has a really great slide deck about all the things you can do with web fonts today. And Monica, also, Monica has a wonderful, fantastic web performance slide deck, which I highly encourage you to look into. Okay? Apparently, I have to finish. Five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Just five. I need only five. Five? Yeah. Five? five, you give me? Okay, so let's see what I can do here. And five minutes. <laughs> this is how it starts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to show just uh, maybe just one thing. So level five, the final one. But this is really, really, really useful. Just uh, when I discovered the custom properties, it was really a big deal. It was really, really useful in many ways. So custom properties, so CSS variables, if you like. Well, now we can have dynamic variables in our CSS. That's wonderful. That's great. However, there is a lot of misunderstanding or maybe con misconception or just concern about how they are different from preprocessor variables and when would we want to use them at all. And there are many ways in which we can use them, and even not necessarily as variables, but really as custom properties. So, and this is kind of also the idea behind the logic fault, which allows us now to separate logic in our style sheets, which is actually a very, very interesting thing. Now, what's interesting about custom properties is that they're really dynamic. Well, with preprocessor, we have the properties, we have the um, variables defined, and then we have a build process in place, and then we spit out essentially the values that we're going to use. But custom properties can change. They actually live in the DOM, which is great. And also important, they are scoped by select in which they live. And they're also used inside of a declaration block. So we can literally scope them, kind of making them a bit more local. They can live on the root selector, acting like global, if you like, but they will also be scoped. And this usually looks like this. Well, let's say you have a smashing red in the top, which is a custom property, um, and you define it, essentially. You define the value of it as well. And then you might want to scope it down to a particular um, um, media query and also to a particular selector. In that point, margin left is going to be available only in the smashing text and cats. That's a really bad naming for your classes, by the way. Don't do that, please. So we can also retrieve the value, of course, uh, and we can also provide a fallback. And the way it works is using the var, and then you bracket it, and then you put separate the main, the actual custom properties, and the fallback by comma. So you have a smashing red here at the first where the color is, and then you separate it with a fallback if smashing red is not defined. Right? Now, that's very nice and great, but there are also very interesting things you can do with it. One of them, which is kind of really, really useful, is being able to reuse stuff. For example, here in the animation, we're defining this neon animation once. Right? Then we have the font, and then we have the border at the bottom. And so we want to have different colors, but we don't want to just add more classes to essentially replicate that animation. Right? So at this point, what we do is we just say in the keyframes animation that we're going to use the variable neon color in you know, going from one filter to another with the drop shadow. 
and then we have the traditional good old animation on SVG, but then we are defining it locally scope on the font and on the border, so we have different colors, so that function, that animation will be applied to both. So you don't really have to redefine or add any classes to define animation there. And this is where you can kind of separate logic from design, where you have that animation bit that will never be touched, right? But then you also have this specific, context-specific bit, which will be changing quite a lot, right? And if we look into some of the crazier things or more interesting things that you can do, um, the, the way you can use them, it would be something like, for example, icons as well. Where with icons, what we often want is a multi-core SVG icon. So you hover over an icon, and for example, some parts of it should change. And in the past, we had to deal with monochrome icons, where we could change things from black to white, to green, to yellow, to whatever. But if we wanted to change this from black to red, for example, with a, a little shade, it was not possible. And so if we tried to do it, this is probably what we would have tried, right? We have that SVG, and then we're using that SVG symbol in our uh, HTML. And then if we want to maybe make it red and make the other blue, what we would try to do is add the icon red and icon blue and use the fill property on CSS, in SVG, sorry, <laughs> to make it you know, red and blue. But if you wanted to make it, it would work for like just changing the color altogether, but not the single parts. So if you wanted to have a different color for each part of the icon, this would not work because of the Shadow DOM. And specifically, if we're trying to style this path in the inside of an SVG, uh, as if they were nested in icon colors, well, they're not really nested there. The use element isn't the placeholder that gets replaced by your SVG definition. It's a reference which clones the content and it's pointing to the Shadow DOM. And so that means that we need to figure out something else. And the best part is about that we can leak things through via custom properties. So we can define color one, color two, color three on the individual parts of that SVG, and then change it depending on the colors that we want to have. So here in the symbol, we have this var color one, var color two, var color three, where we're just picking the color that's locally scoped, that's defined locally, and so this is the one that's going to be used. And so for every kind of shade that we want, we can just change that property locally, and then it's going to be applied. Right? So if you wanted to make a change, the only thing you need to do, again, separating styling from logic here, you would have the brown part, the yellow, the pink, but the actual definition of, in, of that SVG icon is somewhere else. It's more holistic in a way. Right? And even better, I mean, we don't really have much time to do this, but just the final one. <laughs> Seriously, just the final one. So one really cool thing that shows the potential of custom properties is that if we wanted to change the text color to either black or white, depending on the background color, and apply the same sort of logic to borders, right? for example, you have a dark background, you want a white button. You have a white background, you want a dark button, automatically without you having to change HTML or changing CSS all the time. Essentially, this. Right? Where you, for example, might want to change the text automatically without you having to deal anything at all with um, you know, specific changes and specific things in colors. What you can do here as well is setting up the background declarations as HSL, where each parameter is a CSS custom property, and then you can swap the background to any color you'd like at runtime by changing the variables. Again, this is not something you can do with SAS. This is something you can actually do easily with uh, custom properties. We define the hue, the saturation, and the light, and then you have that switching. Right? It's more like a, making this entire CSS that you're building more formulaic, if you like. There is a little dirty hack, which you like, I'm sure. We don't really have conditional statements in CSS. Right? So if you wanted to make that switch for the text color, you need to be creative. So some CSS parameters get capped to minimum and maximum. For example, if you have minus 2 on opacity, it will resolve to 0. If you have opacity 100, it will resolve to 1. And so you could use it in a dirty way, <coughs> in a way, uh, by doing this, right? Where you, say, mm, where you say, well, the lightness parameter could behave in the same way. We just have that switch. We go either beyond the threshold or way under it to land in the land that we want to be. I will send, I'll show that uh, I'll pop up the slides anyway. We just really don't want to make some people angry here. But essentially, you would end up with this. And this is pretty much almost everything. right? You have that switch that will define when you're switching from one color to the other. But because it's all dynamic environment, 
you can just define that box that you need to be blue, blue, and that automatically is going to apply all those custom properties there as well. It's very nice. And if you learn, want to learn about it more, there's this wonderful, wonderful article by Facundo Compradini about it. Okay, so to wrap up, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for playing. This is the story of all the CSS techniques and all this stuff. It doesn't matter what you do, however dirty it is, it will never be just right. So I just want to leave you with this 35 seconds video. <laughs> and then we can go for lunch. Right? So this is the story of the front-end development. No, this is the front-end development 2018. Welcome to the new world. just not fair. That's for designers. <laughs> oh, well, that's okay. Thanks to Parallel Studio for video. Uh, cats, I have cats for you. All right, that's it. Thank you.